Well, you've seen the last of it. We've been working with this series, and if you were here for Bible class, you know that we discussed Christ's last sermon, or last sermon we know of, and we know it's his last teaching in the temple. He left the temple, and he went out on onto uh, the Mount of Olives, and the the <clears throat> disciples had some questions for him. There were questions about, you know, they were well. One thing they were amazed at the big stones that the temple was built of, and uh, they they were still caught up in this idea that Christ was going to rule there. And so in the rest of Mark chapter 13, he's talking about this. He's talking about two events that tend to get us confused. First thing he said about the temple was that not one, one stone will be left standing on another, which would absolutely flabbergast the disciples because the stones they were looking at, some of those were basically 40 foot long, 18 foot high, and 12 foot thick. It takes an awful lot to move a stone like that. But Jesus told them not one would be left. And they didn't understand because they're thinking this earthly Savior is going to come back and fix everything. Why is the temple going to be torn down? Then he uses the rest of that chapter and he's talking about two things. And both of them are prophecies. The first prophecy is about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he explains to them how they as Christians can avoid the destruction. And it tells them to look for certain signs. And when you see those signs, and the sign being the armies surrounding Jerusalem ready to destroy it, they're to flee to the mountains. And as far as we know, there weren't any Christians killed 70 years after this date. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem. They did leave the temple with no stone unturned, just as Christ had said. But see, the other time Christ was talking about was his second coming. And so if you're reading that chapter in Mark, it's very easy to get confused as to exactly which incident he's talking about at that time. So I, we're not really going into that today, but I wanted you to know that, that that's just a little missing space between what they did then and what we're going to talk about now and why we're going to talk about that. And uh, we're going to do it just a little bit different. You know, I didn't, I didn't give you a sermon reading today because there are so many verses involved with this. But if you will, turn your songbooks to page 712. This song tells it all about what we're going to talk about. So if you'll sing it with me. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your heart to God, safe from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians away. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. 
Love of so many cold, losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told, evils abound. When the signs come, nearing the end at last, it will come very fast, the trumps will sound. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore when we meet on that shore free from all care rising up in the sky telling this world goodbye homeward we then will fly glory to share jesus is coming soon morning or night or noon Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. There's a lot of information in that song. What I want, <clears throat> I chose to talk about the second coming of Christ. I did this because this is what the disciples really did not understand. Even at this time, this close to the crucifixion of, of Christ, and they still do not have a good grasp on what kind of kingdom he's going to leave for them. I'm going to do this in a, in a story format. Now this, uh, this story was given as a sermon the first time at Westside Church of Christ in Muskogee on November 24th, 1963. Of course, I've done a little updating, and the guys before me did a little updating, but the story is still... Uh, relevant today as it was in 1963 and it will be every day that we remain on this earth. What we're going to do is talk about a man and his travel through this time. Matthew 24, 36 said, Jesus told them, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Think of the man who's getting up, getting ready for work. What's going through his mind? He says, Oh boy. Just another Monday, starting just another week and another month and another year. There should have been some kind of premonition as the world rose that morning. But Jesus' words were true and sure. For knoweth no man, not the angels, heaven, and not the Father, when that time would come. The day came on just like any other day. People were still tired in those early hours. And John decided not to awaken his wife, Grace. She would need all the rest she can get, what with running around after his active youngsters all day. As he got up quietly, he looked with affection at her one more time, just like so many days before. Grace was a Christian, and she so badly wanted him to become one. 
They'd even had long discussions about it. And just yesterday, he had gone to church with her, and it seemed as if the preacher was preaching right at him, staring right into his eyes. Of course, that surely wasn't true, he decided as he fixed his breakfast. After all, he wasn't the only one there. But it sure felt sometimes as if his soul was the only one the preacher was after. What, what, <clears throat> what was that the preacher had preached on? Oh yeah, he talked about Christ coming again. John had enjoyed most of the sermon, though some of it reminded him of all those tales spouted by the TV preachers giving dates that came and went without incident. He was especially intrigued by the stories of those who had tried to set the date that Christ would come and how some had donned white robes on the, on the day set and climbed the tops of houses and trees or mountains or whatever to be ready to meet the Lord. He mulled over the many biblical passages that the preacher quoted as proof that Christ was coming again and that according to the Bible, he could come any time. Thessalonians 5, 2 through 3 tell us, for yourself, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape it. John knew that all these things would take place and he could not even imagine what they would be like. For 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. John decided that the preacher was being a little on the theatrical side when he said Christ could come again in the wink of an eye. John winked his eye and Christ didn't show up. He smiled to himself, though, as he thought again of his young son sitting next to him on the pew, winking his eye and trying to time it on a digital watch. Of course, Grace and the preacher are probably right, he admitted, as he placed his dishes in the dishwasher. I really don't know what I'm waiting on. Someday I'll take the step and become a Christian. When he was ready to leave, he peeked in to see his sleeping children. Love welled up in his heart as he looked at their angelic little faces. Then he went in to kiss Grace goodbye. As she returned his kiss sleepily, he smiled to think how Happy she would be when he went down the aisle to be baptized. What are you smiling about, she asked. Oh, nothing, he said as he went out the door. He did not know that he would never see them again. It was a beautiful day out, like today. John liked to see the world wake up each morning. I know I like that. You guys like that? You just watch the earth as it comes to life, comes alive early in the morning. Especially if I have a fishing pole in my hand. You like to see it bright and fresh after a night's rest and before it had a chance to become tired and soiled all over again. He also enjoyed the quietness. He had a chance to think on his way to work. As he drove along, the neighborhoods were beginning to stir. Through kitchen windows, he caught glimpses of families eating breakfast. In his rearview mirror, he saw some, some still in pajamas and robes, hair uncombed as, as they dashed out to get the morning paper, then dashed back inside again, starting their day. For some reason, and the preacher's sermon from last Sunday kept coming back to John. 
as he saw people eating breakfast, a passage quoted by the preacher came to mind. Matthew 24, 38 says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until that day that Noah entered the ark. For as many things... <clears throat> as he drove, he, also, he passed a church building, and he noticed rice scattered on the sidewalk. Evidence of a wedding going on the night before, and he thought again, marrying and giving in marriage. He passed a home with a sign on the front door that says, night workers, day sleepers, do not disturb. And he thought of Luke 17, 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. As he drove past a bakery, he thought of Luke 17.35. says, two shall be gathered together grinding. The one shall be taken and the other left. John shuddered and pushed these thoughts to the back of his mind. Why am I getting so morbid? If Christ hasn't come in over 2,000 years, why should he suddenly choose now? I'm strong and healthy. I should be thinking about living not about the end of everything. Losing my mouth drying up. On it. it really was a beautiful day, though. Most of the people he saw smiled and waved. On a day like this, John thought, it is hard to realize that there are so many troubles in the world. Famine and war and sickness and death. On a morning like this, it's just too good. It's just too good to be alive. That too should have sounded a warning in his head. For Thessalonians 5:3 tells us, "For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape it." But no warning came. John continued on his way, the same as every morning, exactly the same. There was no advance warning at all when it, when it happened. Sometimes there's a feeling in the air, you know, when, when something's about to happen, but there was nothing. Often animals with some, some sort of special instinct or nervous, thank you, sir, are nervous with tragedy is a, about to strike, but there was nothing. How often in these good Oklahoma spring and fall days do you feel the hair on the back of your neck stand up before the lightning strikes? Probably most of us, since we live in this part of the country, have felt that. You would have thought there would have been something like that. But there was nothing. As usual, some men were we're growling and snarling, still not quite awake. You ever wake up grumpy? Yeah, me too. As usual, some women were screaming at their children and, and the children of others. As usual, some boys and girls were turning up their noses at the food set before them. While over in India, a sleeping, or a, a sleeping child was whimpering in its sleep because it had no food at all. In China, an official was checking his list of quotas for the week. In New Guinea, a bushman was stalking his game as he and his ancestors had done for centuries. In America, a man was worrying about how he was ever going to pay off his credit cards. He needn't have bothered to do that. A woman was nagging her husband over the new furniture she wanted to buy. She didn't need to do that either. A preacher was looking through his sermon notes, trying to decide about what to preach next. If he had known, he wouldn't have needed to do that either. I could tell that 
one guy, he could just let his wife max out his credit cards and he wouldn't have to worry about it. There was no warning. Life with all its good and all its evil was going on as usual and then it happened. Just as foretold in Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The noise was something horrendous, as, it, as if every horn ever blown was sounded in unison. First... Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Just that quick. Being. <clears throat> John was near a cemetery when it happened. The shout traveled through the atmosphere faster than the, the speed of sound or light. It was a shout that penetrated to the very core of the earth, to the depths of the ocean, and to the center of a man's soul. John panicked and smashed his car into a tree. John had never before heard the voice of God, but there was no question in his mind as to what was happening. Neither had he seen Jesus before, but he knew exactly who had appeared in the sky. No, 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 his thoughts began. Revelation 1 7 tells us, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also, also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The Second Thessalonians 1 7 through 8 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the sky was filled with color. The, the blue of the atmosphere was blotted out by the whiteness of a cloud. The glory of the angels, the appearance of fire, and all of this was almost blotted out by the magnificence of Jesus. The earth began to tremble and its surface was filled with fissures. In the cemetery nearby, John saw the graves begin to open and the dead start coming forth. Their bodies were unlike anything John had ever seen. They were flesh but not flesh, solid but not solid. A word used by the preacher came to John's mind, incorruptible. Some looked happy and some not. He could feel that something was also happening to his own body. John 5, 28, 29 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 tells, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay. John didn't sleep. He never got the chance. <clears throat> in a moment, in the twinkling of eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed John was running now. He was in a daze, and his only thought was to reach home, probably what many of us would do. Something's terrible happening. Where's my wife? Where's my children? He could hear the sound of the trumpet, and he could see people rising into the air to meet the Lord. It was hard to keep his balance, for, for the tremors were increasing. In his head, he was aware of the most terrible cry he had ever heard, the tearing, searing cry of a soul in agony. In just a moment, he realized 
The cry was coming from him. He passed several days people whose funerals he had actually attended. But that did not surprise him. Nothing surprised him now. He passed a funeral procession, stopped in the middle of the road. The back door of the hearse was open. The lid of the casket was thrown back, and it was empty. He ran on. Around him, he could hear cries and wails and shrieks. From above came the sound of singing, a glorious refrain of rejoicing and triumph, but it brought no comfort to John. His soul felt nothing. He glanced up, just as a few were still rising in the air. Apparently, almost all who had been prepared were now with the Lord. He ran and ran. He forced one foot after another. He passed block after block, having to get home. Then suddenly he was home. He burst in the front door and began running from room to room. He shouted, Grace, kids. Grace, kids. Grace's housecoat was still lying on the chair beside the bed. There was evidence of Grace and the children everywhere. But no one was where he had left them only a short time before. Where were they? Where could they be? Suddenly he knew. They were prepared. He ran back into the front yard and looked up, but the sky was empty. He was alone. Alone by himself. Alone in his sin. Then the earth shuddered like an old machine that had served its purpose. An old machine that was running down. The sun was running down too. He could stare at it without blinking. It became dimmer and dimmer. And there was a stickiness in the air around him. John could see stars even in daylight. They seemed to jump from place to place. Everything around him seemed to be flying to pieces like autumn leaves in a windstorm. The earth was shaking and heaving up mountains only to swallow them up again. The sun became black as the ocean's depth and the whole moon turned crimson and appeared like blood. The thought struck John that he must now face God. He was filled with terror. No. No, I'm not ready, he screamed. Stumbling blindly, he made his way back into the house and tumbling down the steps in the cellar, huddling in the darkest corner, he muttered insanely, Hide, I must hide. There was no place to hide. Second Peter 3.10 tells us, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall all be burned up. When John raised his head, he had left the basement, but he knew exactly where he was. Second, <clears throat> anyway. Second Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but everyone may receive the things done in his body, <clears throat> or may receive these things done in his body according to what he hath done while he was here. Whether it be good or bad, John knew that he was with all the people who had ever lived upon the face of the earth and that all would be judged. He knew that he had also acquired a new body, one incorruptible, one that, one that would never fade away, one that could never be destroyed. But there was no consolation in that, for he knew where that body would spend eternity. He knew so much now, but too late. He knew that he had had time for religion, that those other things that he had put first were really not important at all. He knew, too, that those hypocrites, hypocrites on the TV would spend eternity where he was going to spend it, too. There was little comfort now in the fact that he was as good as they are. He even knew that somehow his wife and children would be happy without him. 
For an almighty God who can do everything would see to that. He also knew that he would have to spend an eternity without them with the full knowledge of that fact and that it would be an eternity spent without God, without Christ, without his family. Somehow, he even knew what eternity was like. He had heard eternity talked about. He had heard eternity joked about. But no one had ever conveyed to him a feeling of its bigness, how vast and empty eternity could really be if spent away from God. Without end. Forever, never ending without God. Acts 22, 16 tells us, And now, why tarriest, tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In a sense, this story I've just told you is not true. It hasn't happened yet. Christ has not returned yet, but if you, it is, however, based on scriptural teaching and, and some knowledge of man's natural reactions to events. And it's been told for the one reason, to make you think thus and turn to God in love. So why tarry us now? Arise and be baptized, wash away the sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We may not know all the details regarding the second coming, but the following are solid facts. Christ is coming. Christ could come before this very day is over. When he comes, everybody's going to know it. When Christ comes, everyone will also know where he or she stands. Are you ready for the day the Lord comes? If you're not ready... I pray that you'll get ready today. Meet Jesus through faith and obedience. If you're ready to make that step, please come up while we stand and sing.